1943, at one point, our turn came to. We were picked up, and we were delivered in, a, in an open truck to the largest theater in Amsterdam. Uh, it was used as an assembly point. Very noisy, very confusing, long lines for everything, overcrowded, um, and my parents running into all sorts of, of acquaintances. Um, long lines to use the bathrooms. I don't know how long we were there, maybe two, maybe three days, but then we were transported to our first concentration camp called Westerbork, which is in the northeast of Holland. It was an extremely rural setting. Uh, little cabins, basically one room little cabins, lined the gravel and the sand, you can call it a street, but the paths, uh, which be turned to mud during the rainy season, and we lived in one of those little cabins. We were privileged because other people lived in barracks, which was much more crowded. We had at least, as a family, had one room to ourselves. My mother had to work in a laundry factory, and my father, believe it or not, was allowed to travel back and forth <coughs> from the concentration camp back to his job in Amsterdam. We always thought this was just a local order from the Nazis in Amsterdam, but uh, a few years ago, uh, somebody sent me a book which was translated from the French in which they mentioned the name of my father and two other metal traders. Uh, these orders called, came straight from Eichmann from, from Berlin. So my father traveled back and forth. And while he did that, he organized a large group of Jewish prisoners to sort the metals. Uh, big, big clans, <coughs> and thus he postponed and even saved some Jewish lives. <coughs> the inmate told them that he needed these people to sort the metals. Because twice a week, uh, trains left the Westerbork platforms uh, to go to the east. And that usually meant Auschwitz. I remember my eighth birthday. My mother concocted something that looked like a cake made from potatoes, and my father brought back a doll for my birthday. While the adults were put to work, the children assembled in the central point of the camp, and teenagers, older children, took care of the younger children. I have no idea how we spent the day. There was little schooling, there were no books, there were no materials to work with, but we must have played and amused ourselves. One of those teenagers was Anne Frank. She was six years older than I was, so that is a big difference in that age group. And I never really knew her, but she was one of the kids who took care of us. And I remember her being very thin. Food was based on potatoes and a little vegetable. The camp was encircled in barbed wires with towers, with soldiers. Guns pointed to the camp at all times. And occasionally there were executions when anybody tried to escape. There was a camp store. There was a theater group that performed. The SS enjoyed cultural activities. And uh, they were very good because some of them were very famous actors who were picked up and put into the rest of our concentration camps. But there were extra scenes some of the inmates were allowed to watch. Many, as I said, well-known actors performed, but after several weeks, after several months, there always was a change of cast because people were sent on to the East and new people appeared. Adults feared being called up. There was no rhyme or reason. I still remember several playmates and friends that I made in Westerbork, my own uh, age group. Uh, and they all just, one day they weren't there. They disappeared. I don't believe I questioned anything. I certainly didn't know that there was an Auschwitz, but one day they were there and the next they were. 
as a family, we were fortunate. In 1939, a business friend of my father's smuggled through to us in Amsterdam a forged Paraguayan passport. That passport turned out to be our lifesaver because we were not only held as Jews, but also as political prisoners, because in those days, Germany and South America were on very close terms. <coughs> 10 months after our arrival in Westerbork, our number came up and we were told to report to the platform to be relocated. We were going to go to Theresienstadt in Czechoslovakia. Before boarding the train, and those were the cattle car trains with the little window on top, I'm sure you've seen pictures. Uh, my father had a very serious talk with me. I was nine years old. He took my doll, oops, excuse me, I have the doll still. And the doll has a solid body, but the head is ceramic, and the head is hollow. My father showed me, look, I'm taking that head off. And he stuffed some valuables in there. He had some dollar bills. I don't know how he got them. And he showed to me what he did. And he said, whenever anybody takes that doll away from you, make a big fuss. Because the things in the doll's head may buy us food, or it may bribe somebody. So this is the doll that still exists from those days. <laughs> My father was very astute because upon our arrival in Theresienstadt, we were stripped, we were searched, uh, every part of our body was examined, but the doll they never touched. <laughs> so we smuggled the money through. Um, as I said, we had traveled in cattle cars several days, lots and lots of people, uh, and in the middle of the cattle car was an old beer barrel which served as a toilet. There was a little straw on the floor, it was mostly dark, but we stayed together and we traveled that way to Theresienstadt. Upon my arrival in Theresienstadt, my father again took me aside. He had great confidence in me. Mm -hmm. As we stood inside to be processed, and everything that the Germans did, you have to understand, was long lines and took forever. He saw somebody that he knew and wanted to get a message to this particular person. And somehow, from some old paper or cloth, I don't know, and a rubber band, he fashioned a ball with the message inside. And he said to me, I want you to go to this particular corner there, play with the ball, and then accidentally throw the ball in this particular direction so that the guy who the message was intended for could get the ball. I, of course, didn't know that there was a message hidden in there. Today's Instadt was a camp for the privileged, a model camp, which the Red Cross cross visited to make sure that everything was okay and the wool was certainly drawn over their eyes. They could report to the world that everything that in the camps was wonderful. It was all a sham. Weeks were spent in preparation. A cafe was created, stores were erected with merchandise in it, everything but a coat of paint with flowers were planted. And when the committee came through with the German commandant, a, a group of children were told that they would get chocolate pudding for dessert. Mm -hmm. And the kids had to answer, what? Again chocolate pudding? <laughs> <laughs> they didn't even know what chocolate was. <laughs> Today's Instadt was an old uh, army fort fortress with barracks, usually <coughs> built in a square. Uh, the elderly were housed in certain barracks usually named after German towns. Uh, Able-bodied men who could work were housed in other barracks, and women and children in the third set of barracks. Conditions were appalling. 
overcrowding investigation of vermin, fleas, lice, and worst of all, which is very um, uh, popular these days in the United States, the bed bugs. You can read about them now. But they crawled out of the straw that we slept on. And I know my brother was always covered in bed bug bites. Everybody had to work, even children. I was a messenger in a, a sort of hospital for the inmates, uh, which is an irony because when somebody was very sick, they were put into the hospital, and then when they got better, they were sent to the platform to go to the east. Uh, and I had to bring little messages or bottles or medicine, I don't know what it was, from one wing to the other. But basically, <coughs> I remember sitting on the steps and playing with my doll with another girl. My mother had to get up very early, and her job was to light the furnaces in the nearby mica factory. Um, my father worked in a root cellar under the supervision of a good German. Um, in those days, my father wore ski pants, and in those days the ski pants were baggy, the old-fashioned sort. And at many times, this particular <coughs> SS officer who was in charge of the wood cellar told my father, help yourself to whatever there was, beets or potatoes or whatever was in season. Uh, I'm going outside for a smoke. You're free to take what you want. And my father would put that in his baggy ski pants. <laughs> and that way, he would walk at the end of the day to the women's barracks and deliver it to my mother. Had he been discovered, he would have been shot right on the spot. Um, my father always said that if he would have had, after the war, a chance to testify in behalf of that particular soldier, he would have done so, but the opportunity never arose. <coughs> my mother, my brother, and I lived in extremely close quarters. There were three decker bunks, a very small space between each set of three decker bunk. That was home. Kids usually slept on top. No privacy, no place to put anything, which led to stealing. There were probably eight rows of triple deckers on each side of the structure. I can't call it a room. So 48 people in very close proximity, proximity, sharing one wood stove, people of different backgrounds, different values, different religious persuasion, from orthodox to atheist, which led to many arguments and fights. Um, but I remember very distinctly, children sleeping on top. And in the evening, when the adults were exhausted, we had, we had excuse me, contests who could pass gas the longest? <laughs> there was one big washroom, always extremely crowded, terrible condition. My mother, who was an optimist, believed that in order to survive, we had to keep clean. So she would wake us up, my brother and myself, at 3 o'clock in the morning and make us wash top to bottom with ice cold water in order to keep clean not get sick and thus uh, be susceptible to die. My job at the end of the day was to stand in line for our ration of food. Whatever we did, there were always long lines, as I said before, especially the food lines. I carried a, it's a wooden basket, it's like a tray with two sides and a handle, and inside fit a metal pot and the watery soup was ladled into that, and we got some old bread, usually it was stale, and that I had to carry back to the structure where we slept. That was my job. I had a dark blue coat, and when I walked, and sometimes I swung my arm a little too much, the soup would spill against the coat, and my mother was not very happy. Number one, there was less soup, and number two, she had to clean the, the coat.